Good evening. Welcome to the Glasoff Gang. And the Glasoff Gang is back thanks to you, our fans. This is a fan-generated show now, so if you like what you see, please go to jamieglasoff.com and support the Glasoff Gang. Also, if you do like this show and the themes that we discuss, please subscribe to the Glasoff Gang. You'll see a red button on the bottom of your screen. Please subscribe and check the box of instant updates. Thank you very much. What an honor and a pleasure it is to have with us this evening, Ingrid Carlquist, the Editor-in-Chief of Dispatch International. Ingrid, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Jamie. It's an honor to have you here. And tonight we want to discuss several things, but the title of the show is The Muslim Rape of Sweden. Introduce that theme to us before we get to the details. Well, you know, Sweden used to be a homogenous country. Up until 1975, nearly everyone who lived in Sweden was a Swede. Uh, and then our parliament decided that Sweden was no longer going to be a Swedish country. We were supposed to be a multicultural country. Nobody understood it at that time. People wasn't aware that they actually made this decision. But what we see now, 40 years after this decision, where we have had a huge influx of people from, especially from Muslim countries, during the last 15 or, or 20 years, so what happened is that violence has exploded, and especially rape. Ingrid, I think that from my calculations, you write many profound, powerful articles, especially the Gatestone Institute. I've been reading a lot of them. In one of your articles, you use, mentioned that Sweden is actually number two in the world in terms of this issue. Yeah, in terms of rapes. Yeah. Isn't that absolutely horrible? I mean, Sweden used to be a fantastic country. We didn't have so much violence. And for example, we had never heard about gang rapes. Okay. No one had ever heard about gang rapes in Sweden. So Ingrid, let me ask this. Why are Swedish men engaged in this to such a larger degree in the last few decades? Well, since it's forbidden in Sweden to talk about certain things, some things you can't, it's even forbidden the law, you cannot, for example, make studies on who are these rapists. Are they, are they Swedes? Are they foreigners? Are they Christian? Are they Muslims? That's forbidden. But it used to be okay. So you can go back and see, I mean, the latest study they did was in 2005 or six. And then you see, when you go to these studies that was actually done before, you see that it's not Swedish men that rape. Of course, they do too. But I, I mean, if you talk about people from Iraq, for example, that's one of the worst countries, they are 20 times more prone to rape than Swedish men are. But this is a non-issue in Sweden. You cannot discuss it. Ingrid, could it possibly be that the rapes that are occurring at an increasing amount by individuals who come from Islamic countries, could this possibly have something to do with Islam and its teachings on raping the Kafir and the infidel? Well, of course. It's in their belief system. It's in the, in the Quran that they can do whatever they want to infidel women. I mean, it's actually like this. A Somali woman who lives in Sweden now, she's a very brave woman called Mona Walter, and she actually told me that the reason why Muslim women wear the hijab was because some men went to Muhammad and asked him, how can we differ the good Muslim women from the infidel women? And he told them to tell their women to put on the hijab. So it's in their system that infidel women are nothing worth. They can do whatever they want to us. And when these men with this kind of primitive attitude against women, when they come to Sweden, a country where people are very naive and they don't want to make a difference. I mean, they don't want to tell that these people are like that, those people are like that. We're all the same, we're all equal. When they come to our country and they don't even get sentenced in courts. They, you know, the court make up all sorts of excuses. It was in their culture, they didn't know. Maybe the girl wanted it, maybe she wanted to have sex with seven Somali men, for example. 
Ingrid, let me interrupt for a minute. In one of your articles, and once again, I'd like to thank you so much for your work because I just find your articles brilliant and brave and courageous in the truth that you're telling. In one article, and I think in several actually, you mention one case where a poor young girl had been gang raped by six or seven Muslim men and they got off because the judge and the court somehow rationalized that she... I guess I would say wanted it or didn't didn't fight it. What happened in that case? I actually wrote a piece in Dispatch International just after that saying that maybe it's time that we just go with the Sharia law instead to have four male witnesses to be able to, you know, convict someone of rape. Because this is actually what is happening here. The girl, she was at a party with a lot of... Uh, Somali or Iraqi men and she was she was having a lap of well with one of them so they went into a room and suddenly he opens the door and five other guys come in and she's so terrified she she doesn't scream she doesn't fight because she's so terrified and they are taking her mobile phone telling her not to shout not to do anything but the court said that maybe they didn't understand that he didn't want to have sex with them Maybe she gave the signal that it was okay. Okay, excuse me. You never know what people like, but for a 16, 17 year old girl to want to have sex with six or seven men, it's absolutely out of the question. Well, Ingrid, the West is just in denial and, and, and backpedaling and surrendering almost on every level. This is a tragedy, it's a crime. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the West is afraid to point at Islam. Everything that you're discussing here, it's rooted in Islamic theology, in Islamic texts. You know that, I know that, many people know that. And our audience, if it has any questions, go to Surah 4.3. Go to the teachings in the Quran, which teach, and even in the following example, they're following the example of Muhammad in terms of what he did in war, that the rape of the infidel, of the kafir, is legitimized and sanctioned. And mm -hmm. so let me ask you this, Ingrid, that... You, you also write in one of your articles, and here's another tragedy. In America, for instance, still where we at least have some rationale, we tell immigrants to some degree anyway that America is the land that one should, be, you know, one should assimilate to, at least to some extent, because the left is really winning here too. But still there's a notion that America is a great place, we have great values. You have written in, that in Sweden, the Swedish actually say to the Muslims who arrive that this is a lousy place and thank you so much for coming here. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct, Jamie. We have a lot of politicians, high up politicians, that has been telling the Swedes and the immigrants, of course, that Swedes have no culture. We only they have like Midsummer's Eve and such corny things, and that's why we are so envious of you immigrants, because you come here with a real culture, with real traditions. And the former prime minister, he said a few years ago that uh, all good things has come to Sweden by immigration. The only really Swedish thing is barbarianism. And he says that to a country that had almost no rapes just 30, 40 years ago. And now we are the, in the top league of the world. And he tells us that we are the barbarians. At the altar of multiculturalism and political correctness, Sweden has sacrificed many things, especially its young Kafir girls. What a tragedy. Ingrid, there is a place called Afghanistan. Some people call a place Londinistan but you are calling a certain place absurdistan what is that place that is sweden that is the new sweden we have it is an absurd country i mean we we have we have great values and if we just you know i am not against immigration but the problem is that we take too many i mean sweden take nearly as many as germany and we have are a much smaller country with a much smaller population and we give the most asylum seekers shelter in all of the EU 
And this can't go on. You can't bring in 100,000 new people every year. We have no jobs. We have no places to live. We have nothing. The welfare state is coming down because of this. Well, Ingrid, and also, you know, uh, you know I know that the left uh, engages in, in, in labeling and in accusations such as that you're engaged in racism or somebody like me is engaged in racism when we talk about this. But it's not really about immigrants. It's, you know, it's about immigrants and let's add a sentence who believe in sharia and who practice sharia yeah. people who believe that there doesn't need to be consent for sex in certain parameters and on certain realms and that's the problem yeah the big problem is this week i mean you have been talking about this before but it one could say it many times the problem is not really islam or the immigration the problem is the politicians the media and I would also say the Church of Sweden. I mean, the Church of Sweden, they have nothing in common with Jesus anymore. They don't actually even talk about Jesus anymore. They talk about LGBT, they talk about Islam, they talk about, you know, solidarity with all the poor in the world. But they never talk about the slaughter of Christians that is going on all over the world. If a Muslim in Sweden is, if someone, you know, says something, why are you wearing the hijab? That's a worse crime than Christians being slaughtered all over Middle East. Ingrid, are there places in Sweden where it might not be wise for a Kafir woman to go unveiled? Well, of course, I wouldn't go. We have many so-called no-go zones. The Swedish police told us half a year ago that now we have 55 no-go zones. And that's the zones where not even the police sometimes go in because they know that the gangs are uh, controlling the whole place. Okay, one second. Are these, are these Buddhist gangs or Mormon gangs or born against Christian gangs? What kind of gangs are well, these? Well, they are Muslim gangs, of course, most of them. Uh, when the newspapers write about it, they might say it has, it's immigration gangs. They would never use the word Muslim gangs. But when you, when you look at the paper, when you see who they are, their names, you see they are Almost all of them are Muslims. And, you know, for example, I would tell you that for, for, for Jews in Sweden, this has become very, very dramatic and very bad. In Malmö, where I used to live, I can't live there anymore because it's such a horrible town nowadays. In Malmö, the Jewish population are shrinking and they're all talking about leaving Malmö. You even know that President Obama sent someone over to Malmö to discuss the horrible situation for the Jews. And then, uh, you know, Swedes that don't really follow what's going on, for example, in Stockholm, they, they called me and said, what's happening down there? Do you have Nazis in there? Why, why, why is, who is doing this to the Jews? I said, Nazis, no, it's the Muslim immigrants. Right. Well, Ingrid, we know that in the UK, for instance, with these Muslim rape gangs, the newspapers keep calling the perpetrators Asians as if these are Chinese people from Hong Kong or something. Yeah. The West and the press, it keeps covering up the issue that this is not about race. It's about people, groups who believe in Islamic theology. Before we leave, Ingrid, let me ask you this. What do you personally bring to the table? What, what makes you passionate? What you know, your heart is in this. Could you give me the personal angle? Give our audience the personal angle. Well, uh, do you know the um, Astrid Lindgren, the, the woman who wrote the books about Pippi Longstocking? She's one of, she's sort of a, a person I look up to. And she once said in one of her books, there are certain things you have to do. If you don't do it, you're just a little shit. And this is something that I think that when I found out what was going on about immigration, about Islam, I think as it is my duty, both as a journalist and as a person, as a human being, to tell other people about this, to save my country. I don't know if it's possible, but I will never give up. And I think that the Swedes are beginning to wake up now. More and more people are saying that immigration is the most important um, uh, uh, politics that we have now. 
and integration. And it didn't used to be that just a few years ago. So the brainwashing is is uh, slowly sinking and more and more people are waking up. So I will not give up about Sweden. I hope that one day I will not call it Absurdistan anymore, but it can be my old Sweden again. Ingrid, and part of your battle is because of the uh, just absurd press, uh, you created this journal, Dispatch International, and, and our audience, go to dispatch-international.com. Briefly, why did you start this, uh, this journal? It's because of the denial in the press. Yeah, right? because the Swedish media are horrible. I mean, um, in Denmark, for example, you can actually talk about these things. They also have political correctness, but not like in Sweden. In Sweden, it was a few years ago when we started the magazine, it was absolutely forbidden. You couldn't say one thing about Islam. You couldn't say one thing about immigration. And I felt I, I've been working in mainstream media for many, many years, but I couldn't stand it anymore. All the lying, always trying to deceive people. So when I found um, Lars uh, Hedegaard, the Danish, we decided to do this together and to to mostly write about Sweden because Sweden is in so much more big trouble than Denmark and the rest of Europe. Ingrid, you also are a very brave, courageous woman. You're putting your life on the line. Do you deal with threats? Or why are you so brave? I mean, it's, it's come to the, the point where I can't live in my hometown anymore because people recognize me and uh, there are many people who would like to, well, I don't know if they would like to kill me, but silence me in any way. But I mean, you, you just have to do it. If you don't do it, you're just a little shit. So I, I hope I will live for a long time. But if, if, if uh, I have to die for the cause, then so be it. Are you uh, an individual of faith? Yeah, I am. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a church goer, but I'm. I'm Christian, and I, you know, I used to be an atheist, but. Um, as I've grown older, I've come to realize how much Christianity has done for us and how much it is a part of our Western civilization. And I think that part of the reason why we are in this trouble is that we have forgotten about Christianity. And Sweden is one of the most secular countries in the world. So I think that Christianity is what we need to understand ourselves and why we uh, created the society we did. Ingrid Kralquisk, thank you so much for joining the Glazov gang. Will you be back if we invite you? Oh, of course, Jamie. I'd be happy to. Ingrid, thank you so much. We love you. We support you. Thank you for everything that you're doing to fight for freedom and Western civilization. And thank Best you, of luck Jamie. to you. You are doing a great job. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Ingrid, Thank you very much. And to the audience of the Glazoff gang, again, don't forget, this is a fan-generated show now. Go to jamieglazoff.com and support the show and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next week. Good night.